Hello, and welcome to a conversation around ESGs and Minority Empowerment EST. My name is Phaedra Jackson, National Campaigns Director for the NAACP. ESGs, or Environmental, Social, and Governance Criteria, are a set of standards for a company's behavior used by socially conscious investors to screen potential investments, where environmental relates to a company and its impact on the environment, social relates to a company's impact on society at large, think LGBTQ equality and racial diversity, and governance relates to things like executive pay and diversity and leadership. We are bringing back and centering our communities in the corporate structure. A number of investment firms believe that a company's performance is enhanced by the investments it makes in an employee's customers, communities, and the environment. Over time, the interests of Main Street and Wall Street align, and we can engage as active owners to drive this alignment. Our conversation today will be moderated by Mr. Leonard James, Chair of the NACP Economic Development Committee. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you for that introduction. Welcome fellow NAACP peers and our general audience to the Committee on Economic Development's 113th Annual Convention Workshop, ESG's and NACP Minority Empowerment ETF Visual Workshop. Now, as chair of the Economic Development Committee, it is my honor to serve as your moderator. The nationwide demonstrations for social justice could bring about a sea of change in corporate America, and not just with protest. Environmental, social, and governance, better known as ESG criteria, are a set of standards for a company's behavior used by socially conscious investors to screen potential investments. Now, by way of background, environmental criteria consider how a company safeguards the environment, including corporate policies addressing climate change. Social criteria is an example of how a corporation manages its relationship with its employees, suppliers, customers, and the community where it operates. Lastly, governance deals with a company's leadership, executive pay, audits, internal controls, and shareholder rights. A number of investment firms believe that a company's performance is enhanced by the investments that it makes in its employees, customers, communities, and the environment. Over time, the interests of Main Street and Wall Street will align, and we can engage its active participants to drive this alignment. During this workshop, our panelists will discuss how the interests of Main Street and Wall Street will align, and that the NAACP will continue to remain a trusted voice to inform the industry about corporate behavior relative to racial equity. Our panelists are Yusef George and Marvin Owens. Mr. George is the Managing Director of Engine One. In his role as Managing Director, Mr. George leads Engine One's active ownership and proxy voting strategies for the firm's fund portfolio companies. Prior to joining Engine One, Mr. George served as Managing Director of Corporate Engagement at Just Capital, an independent nonprofit organization that makes it easier for people, companies, and markets to do the right thing by tracking and researching the business behaviors Americans care about most. Before joining Just Capital, Mr. George worked at Barclays Capital within the Global Capital Markets Division, where he curated investment and risk management strategies and established and managed client relationships with international head funds and global asset management firms. He has also served on the NAACP Foundation Board of Trustees, Board of Directors as Talk Tech Association, a nonprofit organization focused on identifying, providing support, and encouraging Black women to build their own profitable tech startups. Middle Project Incorporated, a nonprofit which prepares and unites progressive and ethical leaders for a more just society by using resources to act locally and think globally. Red Hen Collective a feminist worker-owned wine importer that is dedicated to a new wine e economy, 
one that pays farmers first and shares equity. Now, our second panelist requires no introduction to the NAACP. He's a personal friend that I've had the honor of working with for over 15 years. Marvin Owens currently serves as the Chief Engagement Officer for Impact Shares. In his role, Marvin has engagement responsibility for both fund managers and corporations, as well as cultivating and maintaining relationships with financial intermediaries with the global of AUM growth. Marvin is also responsible for strategic relationships with its social advocacy partners and leads the firm in broader social impact and advocacy conversations. Prior to joining Impact Shares, Marvin served as Senior Director of Economic Programs for the NAACP, and in this role, he was responsible for the NAACP's National Economic Inclusion Agenda, which included asset and wealth creation programs with effort that support financial education, homeownership, minority business development, franchising, workplace development, and diversity. Prior to joining the NAACP, Mr. Owen serves as a consultant, lecturer, and technical provider in the areas of community and economic development, small business development, and community organizing. Marvin also serves on the advisory board of Stone Edge Capital, where he advises and recommends monitors funds, investments for economic impact. He is also a well-known guest lecturer. Yusuf and Marvin, thank you for joining us today as our workshop panelists. We'll now proceed to your opening comments. Yusuf. Uh, thank you, Chair James, and, and very, very nice to, to be here with you also, Marvin. Um, as you mentioned, I currently serve as the Managing Director of Active Ownership at Engine Number One, uh, an investment firm that focuses on uh, driving economic value both for shareholders and stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, what I mean is employees, the stakeholders of a company. So employees, customers, the communities that they operate in, the environment, generally speaking. Um, and our goal is to drive long-term performance at companies while also driving greater investment in those stakeholders. Uh, and the way in which we do that is by engaging collaboratively with companies to be able to make the business case to uh, invest in those different stakeholder groups. Um, I also oversee our proxy voting strategies. And, and what this means is as a uh, investment manager, as a fund holder, we have the ability to vote our shares, to vote our values, right? Uh, on behalf of our investors. And what that looks like is um, really helping to move the needle at large companies on environmental issues, um, on social issues of human rights or pay equity wages. Um, and, and, and also on strong governance things like CEO compensation packages. So we use our votes to be able to really leverage and, and move companies on those things. Prior to joining engine number one, I spent uh, seven years at Just Capital. Um, and really my remit was engaging companies on some of these environmental, social and governance issues. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the firm tracking um, and assessing data, so publicly collected information that we would use to see, does a company stack up to what they say they're doing? How do we hold them accountable to doing so? And how do we actually engage and create rankings and ratings and, and investment analysis to be able to, to move them on those issues? Uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of is I helped to develop our corporate racial equity tracker. Um, and we used company data to be able to see um, how they were doing on diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics and standards. Um, and what that did was it, it provided a database, it provided a toolkit and a set of, um, a, you know, set of information that allowed different market participants, be it nonprofits, be it corporations themselves or investors to be able to actually understand how companies were walking the walk and then use that data and that analysis be able to make investment decisions. So I'm excited to have this conversation today. Um, I have a wealth of knowledge on the ESG space and uh, very excited to, to collaborate with you both. Thank you, Yusuf. 
Well, Chairman James, thank you so much for the uh, introduction. And uh, Yousef, good to see you again, my brother. Good to be on the platform with you. And to the NWCB family, it's wonderful to be, be back in, in fellowship with you in this moment. Um, in 1981, the NWCP established what was called Operation Fair Share. And that was established in 1981 as the premier effort with the NWCP to engage corporations around racial justice and racial economic equity. Uh, Operation Fair Share was, the goal was to uh, uh, address issues around blacks on corporate boards and to address the issues around black economic opportunities and franchising or distributorships. Um, to look at what was happening within corporate America around blacks and C-suites and to really engage corporations on these issues in a way that said that something needed to change and something needed to change right away. Uh, the effort was, the, was really revolutionary in a sense because the NAACP was out front in making sure that corporations recognized the need to address internal policy issues as it relates to blacks within those corporations. The hope and the goal was always to understand that corporations played a significant role in changing social dynamics. The corporations had the power to influence public policy in a very, very significant way. Fast forward to 1995 or so. 1995 was the first uh, NAACP corporate scorecard in which um, NAACP was gathered data around what was happening as it relates to progress with Blacks in these economic opportunities at what was happening within corporate America related to Blacks moving up the ladder or Blacks getting access to procurement opportunities and supplier diversity programs and Blacks on boards. The goal was to gather data and use that data to be able to report back to those corporations and, and back to the NAACP constituency and use that tool as an advocacy to move the needle on these issues. And so I'm pleased to, it was like pleased and excited about my role at the NAACP because when I was there in 2018, we were able to take that very corporate scorecard strategy and work with the Rockefeller Foundation and a company called Impact Shares to create what we have now as the NACP ETF. It's an, it's an opportunity to take the cor corporate scorecard strategy and apply it to publicly traded companies in order to move the needle, as you said, as, our, as, as described, around issues of racial justice and racial equity. And this is the key here. The goal has always been to understand the role that corporate America plays in impacting social issues. The, the role of understanding that corporate America does have an important role to play in changing the dynamic on the ground and become leaders, particularly in an environment in which we find ourselves right now, a leader on these important social issues. So happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation and looking forward to how we can unpack more of this as we go on. Marvin, thank you as, as well. Marvin and Youssef, for the remainder of our workshop, uh, I wanna spend some time with both of you getting your thoughts and insights on a couple of topics that are specific to both ESGs in general and as well as the NAACP's uh, Empowerment Fund. And we're gonna spend about the next 15 or 20 minutes sharing your insights uh, with our audience um, attending this workshop. Youssef, my first question is for you. How successful has Engine One been in shaping or reshaping major corporate core strategies to become more focused on ESG related practices? Uh, thank you, that, that's a really good question. You know, we, we are a young firm. Uh, we, we were only started uh, two years ago. Um, and in the investment space, that's a baby. <laughs> uh, we, we launched our fund with a pretty, pretty broad campaign. Um, what, we, what we did was we came to market with a campaign against ExxonMobil, um, uh, and it was an activist campaign. What we, what we wanted to make sure that the world understood was that uh, ExxonMobil as a corporation wasn't focused on decarbonization, wasn't focused on climate change. Um, and we saw that as a material risk to their business and to the environment, frankly speaking. So what we did was we, we set out to, um, to really work with other investors to, to make the both environmental and economic case 
as to why ExxonMobil wasn't a company wasn't a company that was a leader, but was actually a company that was laggard, um, and their their share price performance had, had lagged over time. Um, and so what we did was we we created a, quite a long deck, which you can go on engine1.com and and see see it. It's, we we made everything public, um, but we said three core things. One, uh, ExxonMobil wasn't capital disciplined. Um, they were spending money drilling. They had a mindset of back in the 80s where you just drill, drill, drilled. And um, one, that was negative to the, the overall environment, but two, that was also negative to, um, to, to what they were doing as a company, right? They were just drilling a drill um, and that they were drilling at, uh, in effect, low margin businesses, sites, I should say. Um, the second thing that was really important to bring out was, or to talk about, was the fact that um, their board of directors uh, was a great board, but they lacked any energy experience. Now, they had great CEOs, former CEOs, um, heads of businesses, and, you know, really standout board. But given the fact that they were uh, working in a decarbon decarbonizing environment, um, we thought it prudent that they had some board members on their board who had energy experience. Um, and then the, the last thing was that they should focus on a low carbon solutions business. Um, and so we, we basically made an economic case as to why engine number one, sorry, as to why ExxonMobil needed to focus on the environment and why they needed to focus on um, the value that they're creating both for their shareholders and for their stakeholders. Uh, and we put up a slate of four new board members uh, on their board. Um, and it was a very public campaign, um, and we were able to get three new board members onto their board, which was which was a really a sea change moment in the fight for climate change, um, and really a sea change moment in the fight for uh, investor advocacy. And it's one that we're really proud of because since we launched that campaign and was able to get three board members on, three out of the four, uh, Exxon has dedicated a lot of money to their low carbon solutions business. Um, recognizing that they actually do, um, at, at the very least, uh, talk about uh, a decarbonizing world and they recognize it. Um, two, you know, we've seen lots of success in terms of them being more transparent about their political spending, where they spend their money, um, which is, you know, a massive cultural, cultural shift in what, what we've seen in the past. Um, and three, you know, one of the things that is, is really important that I want to highlight is this conversation around um, what it means to engage with a company. You know, we've tried to, we've tried to engage with Exxon over time, and there have been many uh, of organizations that have been trying to work with them directly, and they just couldn't get through. And so for us, we thought that a campaign of this type, where we brought in other investors, where we made the economic case, where we showcased the the impact that you can have to the environment um, was one that we wanted to do through engagement, through actually engaging the company. And because of that, there was this sort of sea change moment, right? And so uh, that is just one of the examples where we have used our tools of being a investor to be able to drive some change. And I have a couple of others. I can talk about the work that we've been doing with General Motors on the electrification to battery electric vehicles and how that is impacting the communities that they operate in. But you know, the idea is as an investor, you have a voice, you have the ability to engage and really engagement is, is, is a core driver of how you create change at these behemoths of a company. You so very useful information. I'm glad to hear that uh, all of those efforts did make to use, if I may go back to your words, some seed change. Mm -hmm. uh, changing a major corporation that I fully understand. It's like uh, turning an oil tanker totally around and doing those things. And I just want to uh, applaud your efforts for that as, as well. You and all the wonderful work that you and Engine One did. Marvin, as the co-creator of the NAACP's Empowerment Fund, since its launch over four years ago, how successful has the fund been in attracting investors interested in racial equality? 
Thanks for the question. Uh, it has been a great challenge, quite frankly, as Yusef talks about the fact that a fund that is just starting out, um, just a three-year track record, a number of other hurdles that a uh, fund has to sort of overcome in order to be available uh, to the broad uh, broad investor community. But in spite of that, the, the fund has grown significantly over the course of the last three and a half years, and particularly as it relates to the response that happened after the killing of George Floyd. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't wanna kind of highlight a couple of things that Yousef kind of indicated because as we think about the, the, the NACP ETF, one of the things that we thought about in the begin very beginning was um, companies that, that were excluded from the fund. So when we initially launched three and a half years ago, a company like American Airlines was not included in the fund. And that was typically because of the scoring of that of, of American Airlines, the company itself. It was not included in the fund. Several years ago, we, you all may remember that the NAACP uh, was publicly uh, uh, concerned about some of the policies and behaviors of some of the leadership in terms of what was happening at American Airlines. And there was some national action actually related to American Airlines. Uh, now think about that. You know, after three and a half years, when we did the rebalance for 2022, American Airlines made it into the fund. And that's really a result of, as Yousef had described, really an engagement of the NAACP, that, that there was a, a focus on the fact that in order to change policies and behaviors within these companies, there had to be engagement. There had to be the voices of not only the advocacy community, but also the investor community to be able to move the needle on these issues. So there's lots to celebrate the, about the fact that the, the American Airlines is now in the fund. Truth is that no, that, that no perfect companies in any of these funds, but the core here is about how do you engage corporations to, to move the needle internally and then see the kind of progress and change we want to see. So to, I, I love you, Yousef's kind of example about what happened with, with ExxonMobil. Um, the same thing happens with the work that we do at, uh, at, at Impact Shares, where we are constantly engaging and also constantly feeding off the engagement of the NAACP. And unlike many other funds in the market today, uh, the, the social factors that we use to screen corporations are really curated by the NAACP. Um, we really build off the engagement that the NAACP has been doing for 100 plus years in terms of work that's on the ground. And so the fact is that it's that kind of engagement that really is the game changer that will ultimately result in change related to these corporations. Marvin, if, if, if I might just follow up uh, a little bit, you mentioned companies, um, American Airlines as an example, that was not initially in the fund, but is currently in the fund now. Could you describe for our audience the process of how companies are viewed to become in the fund and doing the rebalancing effort? How do companies go in and out doing the rebalancing effort of the fund? Sure, that's that's a great question. I'll try to get into the mechanics of it. And Yousef, you're more the expert in terms of the the, the how the market works. But I'll 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 tell you from the from the advocacy side. Well, we begin really with the universe of companies in the Russell 1000, and so you start with a thousand companies, uh, uh, large cap companies in the market, the Russell 1000. We then apply the social screens that are provided by the NAACP. The NAACP brings its 100 plus year history of engaging corporations on issues of racial justice and racial equity. So you talk about board diversity, supplier diversity, uh, product offerings, product ethics, uh, um, uh, uh, freedom of association policies, gender pay policies, about 18 different social factors that are the result of the work of the NAACP. We use a company called uh, Sustainalytics that actually does all of the research and data dot digging to pull up how these companies score and rank with, against those social factors. Morningstar then creates the index of the top 200 companies that make it into the fund. And so every year there's a rebalance of, of those companies based on those scores. 
Um, there's also a quarterly rebalance that looks at controversies that maybe there's a corporation that has a controversy that has come up over the course between the, the, the year, annual rebalance that go, goes into that, that discussion and whether or not that company stays in the fund or not. But the, the, it, is a, it is a fund that is built on criterion that are, that's been established by the NAACP. So um, as the NAACP engages, as the NAACP uh, uh, talks about what's happening within that corporation, what's happening within the market, the social factors that, that we use are adjusted and changed. A uh, great one quick example is that uh, several years ago, uh, Derek Johnson, President Derek Johnson was, and other civil rights leaders were, leaders were engaged uh, around Facebook and hate speech that was happening on the Facebook platform uh, leading up to the election. And what we discovered was that the current factors that we were using did not cover enough related to the kinds of issues that we saw happening on the uh, within uh, within the the now what's called Meta, but what was called Facebook at the time, and other social media platforms. But that result did in was a an adjustment in terms of the kind of social factors we need to look at. We had to look at product offerings and media ethics and those kinds of things, which were not a part of the initial conversations, but became a part as a result of the engagement of the NAACP. You said before Marvin um, kind of answered the question, he served you up as more of a subject matter expert on this as well. Anything else that uh, you'd like to add to this topic? No, I, I think what you mentioned um, both makes sense and, and is right. I, I think that the, the idea, though, is that um, as the markets change, as social inputs change, um, I think that the, it's important to recalibrate and rebalance, right? And so to, to refocus on what is the goal of what you're trying to drive through engagement? What is the goal of how you can leverage the power of uh, both your voice and, and your ability to go deep with the company um, and where it can drive sort of greater investment dollars, right? Like that, that's, that's part of what the conversation should always be. Um, but, but the core of it is, you know, being able to go into that company because you are an investor in that company because you own it and then deeply have that conversation about the things that you want to see happen. Um, because what most people don't understand is as an investor, you are an owner of the company, right? Because investors actually uh, vote for board directors and then those board directors oversee management, right? And so technically you are an owner of a company if you're an investor in a fund. So um, using your ability to vote and using your ability to engage is really important. Both of you have mentioned some major corporations, um, ExxonMobil, uh, Facebook, uh, American Airlines. I want to focus a little bit on the impact of the work that both of you do on a corporation's brand valuation. Uh, recently, the Standard & Poor's 500 Index dropped Tesla as an example as a part of its rebalancing. I think the date was actually May the 2nd, citing concerns relative to racial discrimination, poor working conditions, and the company's investigation of some other employee-related activities. What are the implications for valuations decreasing uh, for those corporations that end up neglecting ESG efforts? Hmm. I'll start there quickly. I, I think what you, what my purview, so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer it in two parts. Um, one side of it is when I was at the nonprofit Just Capital, it was really important to gather the accurate information to make the assessment on if this company is doing right by its stakeholders or not. That was always really important. Are they actually both talking about things in the right way, but then actually walking the walk in the right way? Now, as an investor, the way I look at it is a little bit differently. I'm looking at material risk. Right? What, is, what is the turnover that may happen because of some of the policies and procedures that are set in place because of poor practices, because of lack of inclusion, because of lack of diversity, right? So when I, when I look at, or, or bad environmental practices, depending on where they build, right? Things like that. So when, when, I, when, I, when we look at and when we assess a company, we're assessing material risk factors 
And over the course of the long term, if that's going to actually um, accelerate or decelerate their, their price per share value, right? Because, you know, we, we invest over the course of the long term. And what we want to do is we want to be able to help to steer the company in the right way to provide value for, again, all of its stakeholders. So, you know, you, I can't speak to, to valuation on a one by, on a, on a name by name basis, but I can speak to the fact that ESG criteria is really important to, to value and to integrate as we think about um, some of the risk factors associated. And, and, and the way we like to talk about it is talk about externalities, right? Um, when we when we actually dig into these companies. And I, I would just add that in, in, in what, what Yusuf just described is really consistent with uh, the recent SEC rulings around ESG because what, what the SEC has pointed out as is that really ESG is, measuring ESG is considered material to a company's performance and material to a company's uh, uh, strength. And the reality is there's been lots of research that's coming out now that talks about the fact that, that in, in engaging in sort of ESG policy, focus on environmental, social and governance policies in a real positive way has a positive result in the bottom line of these companies. And so what used to be Consider just a product of sort of advocacy voices saying that companies should do the right thing because it's just the right thing to do. Now you're adding the other conversation to that, which is you should do it because it's the right thing to do and it's good business. And it makes a difference in terms of their productivity. And that brings value to shareholders and stakeholders. So what's happened over the course of, of, of these years, you've seen a transition from, from groups that are out there advocating for the right things, for the right reasons, to now groups now being able to tie economic performance, to tie efficiency, to tie um, um, access to great to broader markets to the very things that used to be considered simply advocacy or social issues, which is exciting because now the advocacy community has a has another voice in the conversation, which is very, very powerful. Marvin, during your opening statements, you made some references to some very historical programs uh, that were founded, initiated by the NAACP Fair Share, as an example, and the diversity scorecard. How does the current EFT fund relate back to those historical efforts um, and, and some of the work that you and Don and before you, Dietrich Mohammed and others did in those programs? How does that kind of tie and tick back together, taking current day, comparing it back to the historical work that the NAACP has done in this area of economic parity and, and racial justice for all? Yeah, I appreciate that question. I love to, I love to talk about this. And I, I mentioned it in my, early, my opening comments. The current NACP ETF is a direct result, of a, a direct innovation of the corporate scorecard strategy that had existed for 20 plus years at the NAACP. Think about it this way. What is, what is a, 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 an amazingly powerful commodity within these conversations right now is data. Data drives all of the conversations and even decision-making as it relates to these investments. The NAACP for more than two decades was gathering data from corporations related to their commitment to racial equity and racial justice. And it's exciting to think about this because as groups now come to the table and talk about how to engage in this work, the NAACP had been doing this work for a very, very long time. It was, it was built into the business plan over many different uh, administrations and leadership uh, changes within the NAACP. These scorecards, the operation fair share are, are, are the precursors to what now exists today in the form of NACP ETF. And what's, what I'm excited about is that this is an innovation, which means now the NAACP has a new tool in its arsenal to engage corporations on these issues. And it's not simply about the NAACP coming to the table, but it's the NAACP with investor sentiment, with 
the power of, of capital markets that are that's pushing in this direction. And that makes makes what we're doing a really formidable effort to change the course of what's happening in corporate policy related to racial issues and racial justice and racial equity. So I'm excited about the fact that what we have today is a direct result of the years of commitment and work that the NWCP have been doing uh, for so many decades. Yusuf, I don't want to leave you out of the conversation, so we're going to bring you, you back in as well. Marvin talked earlier a little bit about the rebalance of uh, the ETF. Uh, for, our, for our audience, can you uh, give them some insights or information on how often are ESG ratings updated and what would you consider to be an ideal ESG rating if there is such a thing? Oh, that's a tough question. Man. I, I don't know if I can answer you got the hard that. question, you said. Okay, exactly. <laughs> um, look, I, I, I'm biased on that one, so I'm not going to answer because I used to work at, a, at Just Capital, which is the ESG ratings company. I will say, though, that um, the, the ESG landscape has come a long way, and it still has a long way to go. I'm just going to point to some work that was done by Just Capital recently, and it was... Um, I'm going to point to it because it's really important, um, and I helped to, to lead it off when I was there. And it's our cor it was the Just Capital Corporate Racial Equity Tracker. Um, and when we launched, again, the idea was to understand what companies were doing on things like supplier diversity policies, what they were doing on board diversity, on what is the, the actual workforce look like right? Um, all of these data points were really interesting because it then fed into how some ESG index products, financial products would rebalance, right? That's why that data mattered because it was the underlying for some of those tools. It also provided data points to be able to engage companies on. Um, and one that I read recently with Just Capital's updated report was that as it related to the disclosure of pay ratio by race and ethnicity, there was a jump of over 70% of companies disclosing that information. If you think about that, in the past, companies would not say we pay, well, they wouldn't show wage data at all, but, but even getting them to disclose something about like the ratio of what they pay by ethnicity is huge because then you can actually utilize the data and engage a company to say, you're paying, you know, Black, Hispanic employees this percentage less based upon the ratios that you've published. As an investor, I care about that because that means more committed workers, right? That means that over the long term, you'll have less turnover. Over the long term, you'll have people who feel valued and included, and they will stay there and basically drive higher margins. So it is critical that this type of data that is provided by rankings companies both gets it right, but also continues to push because as investors, we utilize that criteria, that data to engage those companies and then do the rebalancing, et cetera. Yousef, I, I, I love your approach um, using your um, <laughs> computer science background. I was a statistics major, so anytime anybody wants to talk about data points and all that stuff, uh, you're kind of well in my uh, wheelhouse, so I really appreciate the attention to detail and the background on that. Uh, my next question is um, for both of you. Um, are there ways to strengthen a company's diversity, equity, and inclusion goals beyond using the ESG framework? What else can a corporation do? I'll, if I can kick it off. So there was some work that was done with an organization called Policy Link, uh, FSG and Just Capital. And we created a CEO blueprint for racial equity. And what that did was it, it provided a landscape of how uh, CEOs can think about the full integration of racial equity across their company, so within the four walls, with, within the communities that they serve, and at a policy level. And that's critical because the sphere of influence of corporations are huge. Uh, if folks have heard of the Edelman Trust Barometer, it's a 
It's an annual report that, that's put out. And it looks at who the general public tends to trust. Um, this year, this past year, corporations are trusted more than the media, trusted more than governments. They, you know, Corporations are leading the trust factor when it comes to everyday folks. And so embedding equity across the landscape of what you do is critical. So, so I would say that is the key thing. It's not just about a diversity, equity, inclusion program. It is not just about a chief diversity, equity officer, even if they report to the CEO. It is about fully embedding racial equity across your business and a, across how you operate as an organization. And I, I would just add that, that to Yusef's response, the, the truth is that the conversations have now shifted in a way that companies are now beginning to see the economic benefit mm -hmm. of these of the DEI conversation. It's it's not simply about um, sort of ticking a box and saying we we have a particular a DEI program or we have a DEI officer that reports to the CEO. What corporations are beginning to understand is that this is an economic concern. This isn't a, a concern that relates to the bottom line and performance of a company. And so shifting the conversation from not just talking about the social benefit, which is cr critical, but also talking about the economic benefit that comes with it, I think is really, really key to moving corporations in the right direction. I would also sort of add, again, add to Yousef's uh, response. I remember years ago when we as advocates were out there talking about a fair wage or living wage was a big deal. We were out there advocating for changes and in, in, in increasing uh, uh, the minimum wage and talk about living wages. Uh, and, and as an advocate, we got the pushback from corporations saying it's gonna cost too much money. Policymakers are saying it's gonna hurt business. It's gonna hurt economic growth. You can't do it. And it wasn't until corporations began to say, we're going to pay our people $15 an hour to start out or we're going to establish something that's higher than the minimum wage as sort of the beginning point within the corporate environment that the conversation began to change on the policy level. So now as corporations take the leadership role on that, on, on that issue, then that impacts public policy. And to Yusef's point about, about trust factor, corporations are increasingly leading the conversations around social issues because these corporations recognize that it's, it's also, it's, it's, it's not just the right thing to do, but it's also good business and whatever happens in the social environment impacts one of their biggest investments, which is human capital. So the truth is now you're seeing corporations take much more of a leadership role. And given what's happening in the country right now related to reproductive rights and what's happening with a political contributions or what's happening around guns and gun violence, I think we'll begin to see even more corporations take a leadership role in what's happening and, being, and really impact public policy in a really powerful way. I think it's very well known that the work of the NAACP, as great as our national office staff is, is primarily done through our local branches and units. And I don't ever want to forget that. Uh, I remember my first encounter uh, with uh, my first branch president as a young person growing up. Uh, president uh, Sam Pendleton was his name. He was an educator and he made an outstanding impression on me that you know, you as, as we rise, we should lift and we should live to serve. With that in mind, recognizing that our work is done at the NAACP through our local branches and units, is there any advice that both of you or either of you can share with our branch and unit leadership to incorporate the things that we have talked about today in the work that they do within their local communities? How can we give them something to put in their toolkit uh, in the work that they do um, on a daily basis. Well, I'll, I'll start and Yusuf, be, be happy to have you join in and, and give you your ideas about this. But, you know, one of the things that has been really, really important to me has been the understanding of the connection between our capital and our voices. The truth is that so often we as individuals miss the power that we really have. The NAACP has done a wonderful job of 
promoting the issues around voting, around civic engagement, and how it's important to be active in voting and be a part of that, a part of that exercise of democracy. Well, there's, a, there's also the opportunity to engage around economics, how we are invested, where we put our money, how do we hold those companies accountable? Looking at these, these techniques, looking at these strategies, looking at these instruments as tools to begin to make known our voices around the things that we care about is an important part of how, part of how we exercise uh, our, 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 our right to engage in a democracy overall. There's, got, there's, there's not, such, not, not just civic engagement, but there's also economic engagement that we can all take a part in. So understanding where your money is invested, understanding who you're invested in, understanding how uh, your investment, that you can leverage your investment to be able to move the needle on these social issues is really critically important. And these economic, these financial tools can really help us to do just that. Yousef, before you respond, let me kind of go a little bit deeper with Marvin. Uh, Marvin, I remember the days when the diversity scorecard was released at the national convention. We would all come into a room. All the corporations that had been involved in that survey were in the room. Yeah. I, I don't think I'm over-exaggerating. It was a very ancient moment, for lack of a better word. <laughs> yeah. Everyone was waiting on that score. But our local leadership was able to take that diversity scorecard back into their communities and negotiate, particularly within the hospitality industry as an example, agreements for their local branch and unit meetings. State conference presidents were able to use that information as they negotiated contracts for state and regional meetings. How can we equip, or is it possible, that the data that you guys have shared today how can we take that information and place something in hand for mm -hmm. our branches and units to go out in, the, in their local communities, just as they did with that diversity scorecard? Do we have that ability using the tools that we have today? Absolutely. Um, if you go to the NACP ETF website, there's a list of holdings within the index. The index has holdings within it. Corporations are listed. And those corporations are all over the country. And branches and units can, util can leverage that tool. Because if you think about a universe of 1,000 or 2,000 companies, Russell 2,000, you have 200 companies made it, 800 companies didn't. And so the reality is you can leverage that information in terms of how local branches and units engage corporations at the local level around those, those social criteria. And the same way you use the corporate scorecard to, 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 to leverage opportunities locally, you can utilize the same tool. Added to this is you can also use your own dollars to make a statement to invest and to say, I'm engaging in this process with my own capital and therefore I'm actually, my voice is being heard in the process. So I think there's a, there are opportunities to, to utilize and leverage this tool very similarly to what used to happen with this corporate scorecard. You said anything to add there? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is around this concept of passive versus active, right? You know, we, we are a body that likes to be active right, not passive. And so the tools that were mentioned is really important because that's how you become active. Understanding the financial system, understanding um, where you can actually demonstrate change, where you can actually actively be um, a member of that change is really, really important and not being passive, not just saying, well, I don't know, because there are tons of tools and tons of services and if you want LinkedIn me, I'll, I'll, I'll send some resources. Um, but, it, but it is really about being active and not passive. My last question before we begin to transition into closing comments is, what can we do as the NAACP to ensure the long-term sustainability of the work that both of you are doing in this area today? What can we do? And, and Yousef, I guess it goes back to you. What can we do from an action item standpoint to make yeah. sure that the work that you, you do has some long-term sustainability? 
I, uh, first and foremost, utilize it, recognize what's out there, um, you know, through the different products that we talked about today, the different resources. Um, I, I'd say that those are really, really important. Um, I, I would also say some of the underlying data is important, not is critical to use, not only for the corporations that uh, are part of this ecosystem, but also for the leaders um, who are out there, right? Um, to be able to say, well, I've, I'm referencing this tool, I'm using my power of voting, financial voting, not even just uh, policy voting, um, to be able to, to, to stir up some action and to drive some change, right? Um, so for us, for, for me, I think that those are some of the, the action items, but it goes back to what I just said. It's about being very active rather than passive because I think it's easy to be um, conservative as it relates to financial, the financial world, um, but being engaged and being active is really where change happens. Marvin? I would just add that that greater awareness of the tools that are out there are really, really important, but also making a determination to use those tools. Um, you know, the, the NACP ETF has been around for well, three and a half years now. Uh, there's, a, there's probably a broad swath of the NAACP um, family that's, that's completely unaware of it. And I think one of the things that's really important is, and that's why I'm really grateful for a platform like this, is to really get the word out, to really make folks aware that this tool exists. And that's important because once you know it exists, you understand you, you'll be pushed to kind of figure out how to use it. And that's kind of work that we do. And that's what I'm hoping that we can, it can continue to engage with the, with the broader NACP staff around is how do we leverage this tool to be able to move the needle on the things that we all care about in terms of justice. And I think that for a the takeaway is that really, really get familiar with the tools, get familiar with, with what is readily available to you. And for the NACP family, NACP ETF is already in the market. It's already out there. Um, there's, there's, there, it, if you can find information about it, you can kind of read about it and understand what it's all about. But even more than that, we can make sure that we're using our capital as an expression of our voice, aligning the ca our capital with the causes that we care about. That's critically important because money is power in a lot of ways. And we have to be able to exercise not only our voices on the electoral processes, but also on the economic processes as well. As we move toward the conclusion of our workshop, I'd ask that you spend uh, a few minutes kind of giving some thoughts and insights to our audience just by way of recap. And Yusuf, I'd like to start with you, please. Absolutely. I think what, what we are continuing to see uh, in the investor landscape is really encouraging um, that there is lots of momentum that focus on both environmental and social issues. And, and, and the way that I like to think about it is it's all wrapped up in governance, right? With, with poor governance practices, you have poor environmental and poor social practices. But with great governance, with great leadership, um, you can actually really start to move the needle and see change on ESG issues. Um, and so I am, I am hopeful that, you know, the markets start to continue to recognize that we can use this ESG data and criteria to actually really get down to the brass tax of it. And for me, what the brass tax is, is the people who it's impacted by, the folks who exist in the communities, the folks who are the employees of the large corporations, who actually are really calling on uh, corporations to not just talk about aligning values, but to actually do it, right? And when they do it, it can then be tracked and measured as ESG criteria, and they can then see greater investment, right? So, so for us, it comes back to, it's really important to walk the walk. It's really important that uh, companies are transparent. And we believe that when companies are transparent and that they um, are upholding ESG values, then they often exhibit um, the potential for greater investment over the course of the long term. Marvin, any closing thoughts or insights? Sure. Um, after George Floyd was killed, there were 
any number of companies that began to go on the record, standing against racial injustice, making all kinds of public commitments, even writing significant checks to civil rights organizations like the NAACP, all as an expression to say, we, we want to do something in response to this, to this horrible crime. Here we are a couple of years later and corporations are now beginning to uh, be, do a little bit of pullback in terms of their rhetoric. And some companies that said they were going to do all kinds of things have not even lived up to the commitments they made right after George Floyd was killed. So I think there's a role in which we can play together. The advocacy community that has, has typically always been there pushing for the change that needs to happen and the investor community, the capital markets that can, can, can come together and work together in the form of, of sort of what we're doing now with the NACP ETF to ensure the fact that that the, the words and rhetoric that corporations use around racial justice and racial e equity are actually lived out, are actually evident in the policies they have internally, that are actually impacting the workers and the people that are on the ground and, and, and really responsible for the productivity of these corporations, corporations to begin with. I think there's a real opportunity for us to leverage this, this, these kinds of tools to ensure the fact that we are changing society for the better. And I think we can do it if we, if we work together. General, let me once again, thank both of you for serving as panelists and for the insight that you shared with our audience during this workshop. Your efforts are truly making a difference in your personal commitment to racial equality and economic inclusion is most impressive. Also wanna thank our audience for participating in the workshop. And for those participants, should you have any questions or should you require any additional information regarding this workshop, please feel free to visit uh, the NAACP at our website. And that website is naacp.org. Put your uh, contact information and uh, we will make sure that someone follows up with your inquiry. Uh, as we begin to close out the workshop, my colleague and fellow member of the National Board of Directors, Mr. DeMar Roberts, will now provide the closing remarks. Thank you very much for that informative conversation today. The dialogue was awesome. As we continue on to build on the work of the NAACP and our partners, there are a couple of points that we'd like to leave as we move to our next steps. Point number one. Companies, corporations, and organizations must shift to an environmental and racial equity frame because both consumers and employees demand action. In 2019, we reached the tipping point for responsible consumer demand. In 2018, 48% of consumers said they would definitely or probably change their consumption habits to reduce their impact on the environment. According to the study, provided by Nelson, Nielsen, which also found that values were reflected in actual spending with $128.5 billion spent on sustainable, fast-moving consumer goods that same year. This trend will continue to grow as it is driven by younger generations, such as millennials, of whom 83% say environmental sustainability is extremely important to them. As consumers want to buy for responsible companies, employees want to work for them as well. In a survey of 2,285 American professionals across 26 industries and a range of pay levels, company sizes, and demographics, nine out of 10 employees said they were willing to trade a percentage of their lifetime earnings for greater meaning at work. Numerous studies have shown that same result, that retention and motivation of a company's fo focus and workforce development depends on the feeling of purpose and meaning. As such, ESG also becomes a useful tool for talent management. Point number two, companies, corporations, organizations can and should be used as a global approach to how their development and measured 
environmental and racial equity strategies are developed. The abstract nature of ESG means that some of the companies should choose to connect their ESG efforts to the UN 17 development goals as they are specific and concrete. Many companies select a couple of development goals and make concrete ESG policies in their areas. For example, they may phase out single-use plastic to reduce ocean pollution under the UN goal, Life Underwater, or reduce emissions and pollution from production or construction as part of the UN goal, Sustainable Cities. Using the development goals makes ESG tangible for employees and provides a clear starting point for the organization. The NACP recommends the ESG from a such, I'm sorry. The NAACP recommends, yeah. The NAACP recommends approaching ESG from such a pragmatic standpoint, identifying a company's ESG focus isn't a separate exercise, but should be integrated into a company's strategic focus alongside their core driving profit areas. For this to be effective, the ESG focus must be tangible and achievable. As we all know, Rome wasn't built in a day and no company will fully be a fully responsible business overnight. However, what is important is to start and to be committed and transparent about it. Point number three, ESG is the new corporate social responsibility. ESG will most likely replace CSR as the corporate vehicle for positive contribution. And this is good news for both people and the planet because while CSR was often a disconnected department with limited resources, ESG is a fully integrated strategic objective that's closely connected to the mission of the company. As such, it gains power as it is integrated into the daily operation and everyday decisions, which is where a company's impact is practically determined. While this may seem like a hostile takeover or a dear agenda by CSR departments, this is actually good news for CSR professionals who may experience a switch in title and, and jobs, but will get much closer to their CEO and the strategic objectives of the company. And lastly, point number four, individuals can make and leverage social impact investing, ESG investing and products like the NACP ETF to ensure that racial equity, diversity and inclusion and environmental and climate justice goals can be realized alongside personal financial gain. ETFs can offer lower operating costs, than traditional open-end funds, flexible trading, greater transparency, and better tax efficiency in taxable accounts. For nearly a century, traditional mutual funds have offered many advantages over building a portfolio one security at a time. Mutual funds provide investors broad diversification, professional management, relatively low cost, and daily liquidity. Exchange traded funds, ETFs, takes the benefit of mutual fund investing to the next level. ETFs can offer lower operating costs than traditional open end funds, flexible trading, greater transparency, and better tax efficiency in taxable accounts. There are drawbacks, however, including trading costs and learning complexities of the product. Most informed financial experts agree that the pluses of ETFs overshadow the minuses by a sizable margin. For the end of NACP and socially conscious investors, our ETF and other investment products rooted in advancing a racial equity and inclusion agenda places the power in the hands of the individual through their dollars. And based on those points, is how we ask that we as an organization and community of partners unite together. Thank you all very much for participating in this session and we hope that it was informative. Peace and power.